Hey everybody, welcome to episode 87 of the Build My Online Store podcast. It's Sunday, February 23rd, 2014. Hope you're having a great day. And one of the biggest things in building your own products besides having them manufactured, doing the quality control, packaging, all this stuff, is getting great photography for your website. And like many things in life, you tend to get what you pay for. So today I got Lex McCall over at Moda House uh, where we're gonna talk about basically hacking your own product photography on your own in a DIY setting. And so whether you have a DSLR at home or maybe a smartphone, uh, Lex is gonna share kind of how he uses uh, both modules to kind of do his work as a professional product photographer. And before we start, uh, some news and updates from my side. Uh, tickets for the Mastermind calls in March 2014 will go on sale later this week. So if you got a store and you want to hang out with other entrepreneurs to give you feedback and to join this community that we're all a part of, uh, make sure you sign up to the mailing list over at buildmyonlinestore.com slash mastermind. So the format of this is through Google Hangouts. Every two weeks we meet for a call that lasts about an hour and a half to two hours. Everyone gets 20 minutes to go through a problem or issue they have with their business. And then we just go around the table giving our feedback input. So some of these examples could be like they need help with site design, and maybe they're looking for an outsourced coder, people can give contacts, or maybe certain advertisements like PLA, where are the best practices, and some experiences that people have had using that platform, kind of things like that, just to get feedback from other people. And so I think the biggest impact so far doing these calls is just having someone to bounce ideas off of, whether that's me or five other people too. So it's also about putting yourself in a situation for good things to happen. So tickets are $99. There's more information about that uh, if you join that email list. And with that being said, let's just get into this week's episode episode on product photography. Don't deliver a product, deliver an experience. You're listening to the Build My Online Store podcast, and I'm your host, Terry Lin. We're here to talk about running an online store and building a strong e-commerce brand to take your online store to the next level. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to check us out at buildmyonlinestore.com. Let's get on with the show. Welcome to the show, Lex. Uh, who are you and what do you do? Well, my name is Lex McCall. I'm, I'm the creator of Motorhouse.com. Motorhouse, a range of uh, photographic accessories for product photography, um, covering anything from smartphones, tablets, tablets, compact cameras, mirrorless cameras, right up to DSLRs. Awesome. And so how long have you been in the photography business? Too many decades I care to mention. Um, probably about 30 35 years now I've been shooting product photography. Awesome, all right, so, so one of the biggest questions I see online now is that there's a lot of DIY content on the internet uh, with I think the rise of smartphones like the Galaxy S4, iPhone 5, where I think you see pretty high quality cameras and can they actually get good results doing product photography with these types of cameras versus going to a professional like yourself? Yeah, you can get some tremendous results from compact cam- uh, from smartphone cameras these days. I mean, there's certainly no substitute for, for going to a professional if you have a budget for that. But these days with social media and all sorts of ways that people share their images or their products, they can't afford a professional photographer. People are, are shooting things themselves with uh, whatever device they have. Our kit and other kits on the market help people get the, um, the most of their, their smartphone cameras. And yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, to- I'm, I'm totally blown away with the quality that you can get on smartphones these days. And so what do you think are the key differences uh, doing something yourself and going with a professional? Because I think most consumers probably can't tell with the naked eye, but certainly when you see a lot of websites, you can tell like, you know, by the lighting and kind of like the composition too. So what do you think are the key differences between doing it yourself and going to a professional? Professional photographers um, come in all sorts of um, levels of experience, I think, and Product photography covers a whole lot of products from, you could be talking a car right way down to jewelry and uh, everything else in between. And there are specialist photographers in all those different areas. These days, though, a lot of um, product photography is just, uh, it's there for a purpose. It's there to convey what the product looks like. It's giving the customer a feel of uh, how, how it looks and how it might feel and fit in with what they're looking for. So if someone wants to get into product photography themselves with, say, like a smartphone, like what would you say are the 80-20 kind of things they should be aware of? Well, I mean, the most important thing I would say with, or, or some of the most important things with uh, product photography with a smartphone and with with any device really you want a, a clear uncluttered background uh, so that you're 
your, your product itself is clearly defined. And, and the most common background that products are shot against is a white background, which happens to be probably one of the most trickiest backgrounds to shoot against. But uh, and Why is that? Well, it's all down to the, the metering on the camera. The camera meter is always looking for a, a fairly evenly uh, lit subject, you know, like a blue sky, green trees, green grass, um, fairly even light. When you're shooting a product against a white background, depending on how much of your product is taken up the frame, you've got quite a lot of a large expanse of white, and um, that has the tendency to fool the camera's meter. So the camera's meter is saying, this is too bright, I need to darken this down a bit. The result you get straight out of the camera can quite often be disappointingly dull. Exposure is what, what I was describing there with the expanse of white background. That's the exposure. Uh, talking about there, so the camera's meter is is trying to uh, dull things down because it thinks it's too bright. Well, there are, there are ways of uh, filling the camera's meter to to uh, brighten things up to the correct exposure that you're looking for. And from the sounds of it, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. So basically, the phones are not really the eighty twenty. It's really like your setup and your lighting that makes a difference with your product photography. Is that correct? Getting the exposure right in the camera is, is is important. And the native camera on, say, an iPhone, great camera, but uh, metering control is very limited. There's not independent metering and focus control, but that's easily overcome by using an app. Say, for the, for the iPhone, the app I would recommend because it's, it's got a very simple interface and it does the job. The app I would recommend anyone uses for product photography for with an iPhone would be Camera Plus. For Android, there's a great app called Camera FV5. And both those apps uh, for iPhone or Android, you should use those as, instead of your native camera. Very simple interface. It's just a question of opening that app rather than the you know native camera app. Those both give you independent focus and exposure control. Basically, like a softer backend that makes the camera on your smartphone more powerful. It gives you control over the uh, features that you want that you need control over, which are the most important one is exposure. So it's exposure control. Awesome. All right. And so I had a chat with another photographer friend about a month ago, and he mentioned something about light temperature, like like white photography has to be around 5,000 kelvins. Can you shed some light on what this means? Yeah, the color temperature, yeah, day, daylight is about 5,600 degrees kelvin. Auto white balance, which uh, is the default setting just about any camera, whether it's a smartphone or a DSLR. Auto white balance is, uh, assesses the scene and decides the color temperature. But if you took a, an indoor shot with a a camera on auto white balance depending on the camera you, you may get a slight color cast it might be slightly yellow or it might be slightly blue or under fluorescent light it might be slightly green these days with uh, with the latest uh, smartphones i mean since the, the iphone 4s was uh, a great improvement on auto white balance iphone 5 was even better i, th I think the iphone 5s i haven't used personally but i think that's probably similar to the iPhone iPhone 5 in terms. The, the white balance nowadays is, is very, very good on the, the latest smartphones, but it, it is a, an important factor um, using the white balance. Both, both those apps that I mentioned also have custom white balance setting where you, you basically select an area of white within your image and you lock your white balance to that area of white. So that will take away a yellow cast or a blue cast from your image. That is really important because uh, a, a yellow cast or a blue cast or a green cast, it, it doesn't just make, make the image look a little bit yellow or a little bit blue, it can really flatten an image. It can be it can be very misleading as well and you can't, it's, it makes it difficult to evaluate whether your exposure is good or not. It's a, a very important factor. But if you're using artificial light, which is fine, you know, I mean, you can, for product photography, you've not always got daylight. Daylight can be very good for product photography, but uh, daylight's not always there. Artificial light is always there, and the, the thing with artificial light, if you've got a consistent set of lights that you're using for your product photography, then that's completely repeatable. Once, once you've got that set up the way you want it, you can go back time and time again and get the exposures that you want. You've got the color balance set to the 
temperature that you want it. So, yeah, say, say for example, when there, there's a set of lights that I often recommend for product photography called Jansjo. That's um, J-A-N-S-J-O. Now, those are household LED lights sold by IKEA. Now, I've got no interest in IKEA, by the way, but I mean, the amount of times I've recommended these lights, I mean, they're fantastic for product photography. The temperature, the color temperature they have is not daylight, it's a, a slightly warmer light. Auto white balance with uh, the latest smartphones can quite often adjust and give you a good white balance exposure, but smartphones may not. So that's where setting your custom white balance and apps like Camera Plus or the FE5 for Android, that's where they come in. Is it one thing I also saw on the internet I mean, with regards to product photography was something called a light tent. So what, is it, what does this thing do? Well, light tents help to diffuse light uh, falling on your product, which is, is quite important, uh, getting diffuse light rather than hard direct light. Uh, Motorhouse Kit, by the way, has a built-in diffuser into the smart case. The thing with light tents is they, they're made out of uh, fabric and they get grubby and if you've got any wrinkles in your background, that shows up in your, your products. Um, whereas Modhouse, we use uh, an advanced polymer which is wipe clean, it doesn't get grubby, there's no way it's going to wrinkle and uh, our diffusers have no bars or cords or anything like that to, to hold them up which can cast shadows so yeah light tents are have their place and they're good for diffusing light um, but they're not very good for giving you a clean smooth uncluttered background I see, especially when you're using like a DSLR that can see every wrinkle or even like fingerprints or dust having a background like that could be really annoying yeah I mean they're a good starter maybe but uh, and for the same price the motorhouse kit would uh you know, it would be a far better investment, I would say, to your listeners. Mm -hmm. I see. So what makes your studio tabletops a little different then? Well, I'll give you a bit of background how they came about. As I say, I've been shooting product photography for a number of years and I had luxury goods such as watches, jewellery, diamonds. And uh, when, I, when I'm a, shooting a project for a client, I'll typically be... They, they won't send me their expensive jewellery to shoot in my studio because of insurance costs, etc. And, and quite often, I mean, I, do, I just finished a shoot for a catalogue where there's over $2 million worth of bling involved. In, you know, so it's um, invariably I travel to my customers to shoot. They can't send you like 30 Patek Philippe's in the mail, right? <laughs> um, I wish they did, but they, I've just been shooting some beautiful Patek Philippe's actually. Uh, there's some on my Facebook page I've just posted it. Yeah, um, so I'd, I'd be travelling around the UK, uh, typically flying, portable lights, portable, is, you know, my camera kit as portable as possible. I used just about every tabletop studio there was in the market and none of them gave me the results I was looking for. And I've got background in design as well and I, I, I'm familiar with a lot of materials so I started to build my own. And uh, every time I went on a shoot, I came back minus my newly built studio because my customers kept insisting that we'd hang on to it. So I kind of realized that's something that I could share with people. So my kit is designed by a photographer for photographers, and I think that's a big difference. And so if I go back to lighting a little bit, so if I want to take product photography on my own with Camera Plus, like you said, on, say, like iPhone 5, and you were mentioning IKEA lights are quite uh, good quality to use. I mean, do I need to buy, like, two or three lamps to go with this, or do I need to buy, like, like a professional studio lighting to go with this? I mean, there's a blog post that did uh, a guide on um, pro photography lighting, and I cover everything from these IKEA lamps, which are about 10 bucks a piece. Typically, no more than two or three lights is, is what you should need. So picking up like one of your tabletop studios with like two IKEA lights is pretty doable, just as like a bootstrapper, really low budget way to get started, right? Yeah, well I've, I've got every every kind of light there is for pro photography at my disposal. I, I use my Giants Joe LED lights more than anything. I've got speed light flash guns, I've got Bowen's um, monoblock heads, I've got, you know, which is a big studio, professional studio flash, and, and everything else in between. The compact fluorescent lights, is, uh, or CFL bulbs, is uh, it's another common uh, light that's used in product photography these days. C CFL bulbs, uh, you've got those in daylight color temperature. Um, 
they can be very useful. As they're daylight balanced, then your auto white balance in your smartphone is, uh, in any smartphone, no matter how old it is, um, you should get good results. But there's one thing you should watch out when you're using CFL bulbs, and that's the, the CFL bulbs themselves send out vibes that interfere with the image on your, your smartphone. So you really have to make sure that you keep the CFL bulbs at least three, four feet away from your camera. Right. And so say you know, we managed to fiddle out our own studio, uh, either with one of your products or like a DIY situation at home. You know, once we have these photos, do we need to do any post-production and say Photoshop or anything like that? Well, shooting on um, a, like a really handy workflow of... Um, I've used in the past with, with my phone and tablet. Shooting on my phone and then post-processing on my tablet, you know, is, is fantastic low workflow. There's some great apps. I mean, Photoshop's a very expensive app, application for people to invest in. You know, for a dollar or two, you know, you get some fantastic apps like Snapseed. And I think Snapseed may be, yeah, Snapseed is definitely on Android as well. I would advise against overusing preset filters when, when using these kind of apps, or if you are using them, using them judiciously but the but Snapseed for example has uh, a feature where you can tune the image and you can tune brightness and I think the latest upgrade for that you can also independently uh, adjust your shadows as well which is a very useful feature I mean there's a number of our customers uh, shoot with smartphones and they, they're selling all sorts of products online some of the same customers have DSLRs one of the most difficult things when you're shooting product photography with a DSLR is, is shooting an overhead shot, getting your camera totally square on to your subject. You're typically using a, an expensive tripod. As a result, you've got to watch out for shadows. You've got a heavy camera on the end of a, a boom arm. It's liable to tip, tip over and very tricky to get it square on. The, what I would say, I mentioned limitations of smartphones. Um, what, the main limitation is that most smartphones have what I would term as a wide angle lens. An iPhone or Samsung S4 typically got a focal length equivalent of 35 millimeter. The, the focal length equivalent is approximately 30, 32 millimeters which is quite wide angle. But that's related to a 35 millimeter film format, by the way, just to clarify. Like what, how does the focal length change the shot and like, how does it make it look different? Wide angle lens means, say you're taking a photograph of a ring, you went in as close as you possibly could with, a, with a, an iPhone or a, a, a Samsung S4. Or, you probably fill quite a large part of the frame, but uh, you're gonna have what's called barrel distortion, where it, dis, it distorts the image in a kind of barrel shape it can be quite quite effective it's, you know you know what a fisheye um image looks like oh okay because it's so close that uh, okay i think i think i get what you're talking about now yeah it's, it's not quite as extreme as a fisheye but it's, it's going in that kind of direction so that's that's the kind of limitations with a smartphone uh, though you've got the nokia now with optical zoom digital zoom destroys image quality so you know you should avoid using that but having said that, you know, with um, you know Samsung S4 with its 13 megapixels, you've got enough megap megapixels there to shoot with its wide-angle lens and then crop into the image or, or even zoom into the image using digital zoom. You're not going to get that barrel distortion. And you've got enough, certainly more than enough megapixels, even with your cropping in, to reproduce that image online, which these days a lot of images are destined only for use online. So. All right, and so let's just wrap up a little bit here. So uh, what are some common mistakes you see people making in product photography when they're trying to do it themselves? Piling on loads of light, more and more light isn't the answer. Uh, what you want is good, diffused, even light. If, if a product looks good once it's in your tabletop studio, if it looks good, then it should shoot good. Piling on more light will give you hot spots, it'll give you hard shadows. What you want to do is pull your lights back a bit, diffuse your light through a smart case like the Moda House kit or, or indeed through a, a light tent if you've got a light tent. So diffuse your light, generally speaking. 
you know, there's nothing wrong with shadows in the right instance, and shadows can be effective. But as I say, I don't like making reels. But that, that's the most common problem I see, is people just piling on more light. Another quite common mistake is mixing light sources. So if you're using an artificial light, say like these LED lights we discussed, use only those LED lights. Don't use any other artificial lights in the room. Don't use daylight. If you can, you know, close the curtains or close the door. Keep out any other light. So you want to cut out extraneous light and just have one colour temperature of light, whether that's, you know, it might be three versions of the same light, three LED lights, for example, as as long as they're all the same. But don't mix your lights because doing that mixes your colour temperatures. You know, your lot of white balance hasn't got a chance of uh, eliminating a colour cache. You've got a colour cache somewhere. So is this when someone takes like a photo of like a friend outside, but they're kind of near a building and then... Their face may look, might look yellow, but then you have white light uh, coming from the background. Is this what you're talking about? Yeah, you've got mixed. Uh, you might have mixed lighting in that situation. Yeah, awesome. All right, and so the top two mistakes uh, are uh, using too much light and mixing light. Uh, do you have a third one? Yeah, uh, keep it steady. Use a waterhouse steady stand or use a, a, a small tripod. So keeping it steady, and that's really important because with any smartphone you've got, um, when you release the the camera, there's a a lag of, you know, it might just be a fraction of a second, but it's long enough. If you've got that handheld, it's long enough for you to to move the camera just even one or two millimeters. And whenever you're shooting at close quarters, you have a very short depth of field or short depth of focus. Moving just a few millimetres or a fraction of an inch is enough to throw your focus out. And when you release the shutter button, that's when your camera locks focus. When it takes the picture is when it, when the shutter opens. And if your camera's moved, then you're out of focus. So use a stand, use a steady stand, use a, tri- a mini tripod, anything like that. Uh, keep it steady. That's, that's, that's really important. Yeah, and there's no reason to not get a tripod now because they're really not that expensive. You, like, like if you can afford an iPhone, you can afford a tripod. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> All right. And so, you know, in the worst case scenario, say we've tried this ourselves and it's just not working out. You know, when we're looking for a product photographer, like how should we pick one? Look at the portfolio. Product photography comes in all shapes and sizes. If if you if your product's jewelry, then I mean jewelry and diamonds is often regarded and often regarded as as the most difficult subjects because they are reflective mainly. A lot of watch brands like Protect Philippe. If you look at their own catalog, they shoot all their watches with the glass removed from the the watch to avoid reflections, yeah. Yeah, check out a photographer's portfolio. You want a product photographer, if you're hiring a product photographer, go for a product photographer who can demonstrate that they have experience in, in shooting the type of product that you have. So basically make sure that the photographer you choose has domain knowledge in what you're shooting, right? Like if someone's shooting, like say animals, I shouldn't pick him to shoot my watches because he probably has no experience in that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, choose your photographer wisely, I would say. Yeah, yeah awesome. All right, and so wrapping up, uh, where can we find you online? Um, modahouse.com, that's M-O-D-A-H-A-U-S.com. And uh, you'll find me at Facebook slash Modahouse, Twitter at Modahouse, capital M, Modahouse, YouTube um, slash Modahouse. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Lex, for coming on the show. Uh, listeners, you guys can find out more at modahouse.com. Uh, they do sell three tabletop studios there, uh, kind of for your own home product photography. Uh, Lex uses this himself, as you heard, outside on jobs. So check them out, modahouse.com. And Lex, uh, thanks for coming on the show, and we'll keep in touch. That's great. Thanks for your time, Terry. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Build My Online Store podcast. If you want the show notes, make sure to check out the website at buildmyonlinestore.com. If you've got an e-commerce store, every two weeks I lead a live mastermind call with about five or six of the listeners in two separate groups where we work openly together and solve a business problem that you have. And we're all there to support each other. So if this sounds like your cup of tea, make sure to check us out at buildmyonlinestore.com slash mastermind. Thanks again for tuning in and I'll catch up with you guys next week.